Hello, my name is Sandy Fifecoat and I will be your host. Now in this video, we will be discussing the Common Core State Standards, but we'll be doing so from a perspective of the integration of informational text across all the different content areas. And I'm really excited today because joining us in this discussion is the award-winning children's science book author, Seymour Simon. And of course, Seymour is also a teacher uh, and has been a practitioner in the classroom for a good number of years. So we're just thrilled to have Seymour today. Thank you so much for joining us today, Seymour. Thank you very much. I'm very excited to be talking about Common Core and the new standards in teaching. Well, we're thrilled to have someone with your breadth of experience. I know a lot of our teachers use your materials already in the classroom. So let's just jump right in. What do you think the Common Core Standards really tell us about this increased emphasis on informational or nonfiction material that can be incorporated across content areas? What do you think the Common Core Standards really say to that? The first thing about Common Core is that I'm in complete agreement with the standards. In fact, I think that the Common Core standards could easily be called the Common Sense Standards. I mean, Common Sense because this is the way kids should be taught. Uh, you know, Common Core emphasizes the balance of fiction and nonfiction from kindergarten and up, especially for younger readers. In the past, younger kids were reading fiction at an early age. They probably didn't start reading a nonfiction until uh, third or fourth grade. But with the common core standards, as early as second grade, kids are expected to be able to read information texts in social studies, science, and technology, and to read it with understanding. And the second point is that when you read information texts, you learn about all kinds of things. You learn about the world around you. You get excited is about learning about the real world, and you learn how to gather information from what you read. Another important point is that when you read the Common Core standards, you're building up a vocabulary of what we might call academic language, and it means going deeper. So, for example, you don't just talk about clouds, but you talk about cumulus clouds. You don't just talk about dinosaurs, but you talk about Tyrannosaurus. You don't just talk about stars, but you talk about Polaris, the North Star. And what that does, it gives children a chance to dig deeper into a subject. And I think that that's exactly what children want to do. Any kid who's interested in dinosaurs doesn't just want to read one book about dinosaurs. He wants to read every book that there is about dinosaurs. And he wants to be able to name all the dinosaurs. Common Core Standards also want us to teach skills that children need to do research and to write reports. So these are real-world skills. You know, you just don't read novels for these real-world skills. You have to read nonfiction, both in printed books and in digital books as well. So you have to understand how authors use the words that they write, how they use pictures, how they use graphs to convey their meaning. And one of the wonderful things about using trade books and trade e-books rather than only textbooks is that you get multiple sources on the same subject to gather information and to write a report. Those are really good points, Seymour. Of course, the $64,000 question for every teacher who is listening to this podcast or seeking any other guidance with Common Core Standards is how in the world do I integrate this kind of information, and in this case, use, use of informational text? How do I integrate that into my daily work and my daily curriculum planning? as opposed to just making it a standalone thing that I have to check off. Yeah, I think that there are several ways in which teachers can integrate this. I think one of the ways is to use um, the uh, visuals in uh, e-books in particular so that all of the kids can get interested in the subject. I think that good nonfiction is kind of narrative nonfiction. It combines real fact with a compelling story. So, for example, one of the books that we've published digitally is a book by uh, Kathy Lasky called Dinosaur Dig. And the uh, Dinosaur Dig is a story of a family going on a dinosaur bone hunt, or a book by Doreen Rappaport called Living Dangerously, which is subtitled American Women Who Risk 
their lives for adventure. This is not only going to give information, but it's a story and it's going to make a, a way of learning about science that isn't dry. I think another wonderful way to um, teach nonfiction is to teach how to uh, write nonfiction. In fact, that's one of the uh, guidelines on the Common Core Standards is to learn how to write nonfiction. One of the things that I learned in 25 years of teaching is that teaching kids to write is as important as teaching kids to read. And what I like to do is to use examples from my books and other books to help explain unfamiliar ideas, complex concepts, and impossibly large numbers. So, for example, in a book of mine called The Universe, I wrote, a photo covers a speck of sky the size of a dime seen from 75 feet away. From Earth, some of the galaxies in this photo are as faint as a flashlight on the moon would be from Earth. And I like to use all kinds of other techniques to enhance both the reader's understanding and the way in which kids can write dramatic nonfiction. So I use strong verbs that enhance a reader's understanding. And in a book of mine called Earthquakes, which is available both in print and in digital, I write about an earthquake. Houses began sliding apart. Cracks in the pavement opened and closed like huge jaws. The ground rolled in waves. I try to use verbs which are exciting verbs. And I also, because I'm writing books as stories, not just as lists of facts, I try to engage the reader's sense and imagination and set a scene. And I've written a book called Wolves. And in the beginning of Wolves, I set the scene in this way. Imagine snow falling silently in the great woodlands of North America. The only sounds are from the trees creaking and tossing in the wind. Suddenly, the quiet is broken by the eerie howling of a wolf and all the frightening stories and legends that you've heard about the treacherous and sly wolf and the evil werewolf begin to race through your mind. I use all kinds of techniques. So in another book, which is also available in print and digital uh, that I just wrote called Global Warming, I ask questions uh, that anticipate what the reader is thinking about as he or she reads. And I think that kids often use this technique in what they write when they ask questions. And I wrote something like this. Why is climate changing? Could Earth be getting warmer all by itself? Are people doing things that make the climate warmer? What will be the impact of global warming? And can we do anything about it? I also love to employ descriptive detail in the stories that I write. And these are really stories. So in a book on butterflies, which is available both in print and digital, I've written, as leaves change color in autumn, monarch butterflies begin an incredibly long journey to places they have never seen before. On tissue paper thin wings, the butterflies ride the wind as far as 3,000 miles to their winter homes. So in all of these techniques, I try to use techniques which involve the reader from the very beginning. We have just published two of my print books, republished them, updated them, made them more compelling. One is called Earth Words. The other is called Space Words. These are reference books that kids love to browse. Uh, and reference books like this builds vocabulary and science knowledge. It inspires kids and their natural wish to be updated about a subject. I think that what's particularly valuable about a digital book is that you can do a kind of a quick research. We have a search function. I think that it's important to teach students to look up or search for several books on the same subject. And that's why um, we were so insistent when we did our program, when we published our program that supports Star War kids, that we have a search function and that both uh, children and teachers can use the search function, not just by title or uh, author, but also uh, by topic and concept as well. What I love about what you've done is broken the myth that informational text is boring factual reporting, that informational text can in fact be 
represented in a story with engaging literary technique and that putting these things on a digital device even further enhances their application to teaching and learning. I want to talk a little bit about science in particular. And I know your expertise, and as you've also just demonstrated, is in writing science books that really engage students. I think that the important thing that I can remember and that I still encounter when I speak to children in schools across the country is that science is fun. By the time uh, I finished speaking about my science books, uh, they think that any notion that they ever had that science was boring has been dispelled. Uh, Science is not hard. It's fun. And one of the ways that you can make science fun is that you need books which are not just about a subject, which books that children can enjoy, and not just books that are full of facts. And I think that it's important to give a wide variety of books so that it's possible not just to search for a book about, a particular book about a subject, but for lots of books about a subject. I have a series I uh, co-wrote uh, with another author whose name is Nicole Fautou, and it's called Let's Try It Out. And one of the books is called Let's Try It Out with Bridger's Towers. And it's uh, especially hard to find a book that's about engineering for early childhood. And this book, which is really uh, for uh, kids in anywhere from pre-K with the help of uh, caregivers or uh, teachers uh, up through second grade, is a book about uh, science activities that they can try with the simplest materials, which will show them how bridges and tower, towers work. We also try to do books which combine a different subject. So, for example, a book of mine which show, we have on our um, digital list is called Amazing Aircraft, Aircraft, and it has great pictures of aircraft, uh, plus stories about the history of aviation, and it combines social studies as well as science. Uh, we have a whole series of um, social studies books uh, by Hudson Talbot, And in his King Arthur books, um, which um, are just wonderful uh, retellings of the King Arthur legends, Uh, but a book like that can can be combined with a science book that I wrote called Knights and Castles, so that you can not only read about King Arthur, but you can also read about Knights and Castles as well. I think it's important to note that the platform which we introduced which is uh, Star Wars Kids, um, in order for it to work in schools, and as as a teacher for many years, I knew that it wouldn't be attractive unless it was affordable, unless it had multi user functionality, unless everybody in the class could read the same book, or every kid in the class could be reading a different book, unless it could be read by anything that the school has so that it was device agnostic, could be read on any digital device, including um, desktops and laptop computers, uh, whiteboards, tablets, smartphones, and most important, it had streaming access anywhere that a user has Internet connectivity. So, for example, every kid in the class who's reading a book can bring that book home and continue reading it at home on any device that they have it. Well, that's really wonderful, and I really do applaud Starwalk Kids for bringing to teachers uh, that kind of content. Sadly, this is all the time we have left for today. Seymour, I really want to thank you so much for providing this information, and I want to thank Starwalk Kids also for sponsoring this important podcast. It's really been helpful for me and I know to our teachers as well. Now, for teachers who are listening, we ask you to please stay tuned for our top three You Should Know facts about ebooks and the Common Core. And we'd also love to hear from you. We hope you will email us at whatcast at weareteachers.com with your thoughts, any feedback, and also topics that you might want us to cover in the future. So thanks again for joining us and have a super day.